Good afternoon, I mean, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome to. Can you have the title to display? Sorry, the title to the panel. Make sure that we so, earlier today, we have um, the first session of migrated um, archives. Um, right now, we go into the second session, New Nigerian Perspectives on the British Union Migrated Archives Part 2. And um, we have, I think our presenters are here. Um, we have uh, Sarah Hope. From University of Port Harcourt. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, Ismail Amadou Bilu University, Zari. Then we have um, Idris Olani Kolabo, the University of Ibadan. I hope we are all here. Yes. So we start with wasting much of our time. I uh, will call on Sarah Hope to take the floor. Uh, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe Sarah could be done better. I am presenting on the position of the the for a the introduction, even though we are not going to be able to be to be able 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 to be to be able to be the death of the person is responsible for the process of life. But the death of life is not just a society. You know, as such, there was no children. She was in the end of the world. You know, I said, it is about the child who will be working space. The videos are all concentrated in the impact of the civil service and the French Uh, 
The traditional the rulership in uh, the Kepelach is a broad function from the colonial mass who created uh, foreign chiefs to be able to make who created the king so that they would have like um they will have a central government from which they will be able to interact with the people. So if such if the, the culture could be affected by that, why not also? The management of widows and orphans, instead of insisting that the tradition does not allow women to um, allow women economic uh, sustenance, and the objective is to analyze to which extent widowhood practices dehumanize and limit the potentials of widows and orphans in a fair land, to investigate the rate at which the particular nature of a fair culture and tradition undermine the rights of widows and orphans, examine whether widows and orphans in a fair land can be receptive to economic empowerment, analyze strategies of which widows and orphans in a fair can be economically repositioned, like, rather than leave them in, um, in, in poverty. What's the significance of this study? Nigeria's population explosion is not accompanied with significant economic growth. Therefore, supposing that widows and orphans will be cared for by extended family members is to live a lie. A Kine 2014 tells us that the reason why a pair is still um, holding on to the tradition of leverage marriage and still holding on to uh, absorbing the widow into the uh, extended family system is because it is their tradition. But today we see that things are really difficult. So leverage marriage, concubines and cohabiting widows are more likely to be HIV positive than single cohabiting women due to the death of their former spouses who may have been HIV positive. And this is from the health angle. As Fak Ben Ide, and De Bayo and De Mudia 2016 explained to us in their research, the price of food is soaring every day in Nigeria. There is little room for handouts. So you can't say you take care of them, you will absorb them. You don't even have enough for yourself. We can see that those who visited Lagos, I visited Lagos in March, I see the difference in the food I am being served. Then what is the scope of the study? The, 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 the study covers widows and orphans' well-being in Nepal and from the period of 1999, when scarcity became very evident in a once buoyant economy to February 2014, the study examines male and female adults of age 18 to 15 55 who are married or married, children from age one to 16 years who are um, orphaned. As a matter of fact, when the researcher conducted some interviews, some very young 25, 28, 30 year old men who lost their wives said they were given opportunity to marry. In fact, they married immediately. But the wives who lost their husbands never got such opportunity and they, were, they are really suffering, left with little children to care. So we reviewed um, the concept of widows and orphans, widowhood, the practices around the world in Nigeria and Nepal land in particular, and reviewed the economic position of widows and orphans in Nepal land as it is today. This work went ahead to review the economic repositioning of widows and orphans in Nepal land, making references to efforts by governments, non-governmental organizations, religious organizations, and philanthropists who have intervened variously to empower these vulnerable groups. The work also pointed out the challenges that truncated such laudable efforts and therefore giving rise to the call for a more sustainable intervention. This work is advocating for sustainable business initiatives that will support and guide the beneficiaries from the scratch, tax, mentor, and coach such beneficiaries to the point of interacting with um, their with his or her con uh, consumer. Of course, um, this brings the um, brings the, the, the path to the future. Before now, um, NGOs would come, give one-offs and so on. Go, go, um, governments would intervene, give one-offs and so on. But we have seen that we cannot be getting that. We must make plans, better plans for the widows and orphans in Nepal. And, and we are studying the six Igbos in Nepal. Um, and Igbo is clans. You know, you have clans. And these clans make up the entire Nepal land. Igbu Bie, Igbu Ako, Igbu Pata, Igbu Guduya, Igbu Ehoda, Igbu Gobi, which is the recent creation, and a lot of people are still clamoring for much more. The fair might know that this is for political reason, anyway, but they are there. The theoretical framework used for this um, work is Kimberly Kenshaw's um, 
Crenshaw's intersectional feminism as a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. The widow is stigmatized, the widow is ostracized, the widow is um, in a lot of ways, um, she is like an outcast. Sometimes they don't even let some of them attend markets within the communities because they are considered to be evil. So to lose your husband is like you have brought evil to yourself. So the research design adopted for the survey is the survey research design. And concluding, there is no need for anyone to continue to think that widows and orphans can be accommodated economically within the circle of close relatives. Doing so will be living in mirage or living in self-deception. Most of the widows and orphans this work is advocating for live in the rural areas with very limited social infrastructure. Being a widow or an orphan living in some of these rural areas is like being banished from life and waiting for death. These vulnerable populations live in challenging and unfortunate situations. They are in their need of intervention that will foster methodical and stable growth, not minding their level of education. This will erode the dependency syndrome under which the Ekpeye customs and traditions have implanted in the Ekpeye people. It is a matter of urgency that any sustainable business initiative is preferred in this work, and it should be assessed by widows and orphans and to help re rebuild their self-esteem and cope with the challenges of their loss. It is of utmost importance that they be trained in production of goods and services so that they can develop to being employers of labor rather than endlessly searching for non-existent white collar jobs. They should be trained in starting and managing small businesses no matter from what late corner they may be so that future economic structures will not be a big shock to them. And recommendations include my recommendations. So thank you for the applause. But I, I, this work is recommending that widows do not have access to farmlands in their land, and that's the custom they are, you know, they are hanging on to. It's a big worry, but we are believing that in the next five years, if we continuously advocate that people will listen to us, governments will listen to us. By the way, River State government has already um, signed the law that gives rights to girl child to inherit from her direct father. That's another conversation. I won't waste your time with that. But the implementation is a problem. Then the orphans need to be encouraged. Most of them are recruited as thugs to politicians. If we give them something sustainable, they will not think in that direction. The insecurity in a pair that has been there for the past 12 years that culminated in the killing of the, is, um, the police um, how many months in September last year? And that she is as a result of people doing nothing because they do nothing, they are recruited to be given and whatever. So, I thank you for listening to me. I think that is a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And we will continue after to ask that question today. So for now, let's listen to what went missing as we discovered my data archive and the play of Nigeria's decolonization process in 1950 from by Ismail Musa and Mamadi Uh no, the second one. The second one. Which one? The one box. Oh, that is my year. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ismail Musbao from the Sumatran University area. I would like to first of all uh, give a brief description about my presentation so that if time allows, I'll follow the, the few slides I have one after the other as quickly as possible. Um, the original title uh, is uh, on divide our room, my greater archives divide our room and uh, decolonization in northern Nigeria, 1953 to 1964. As a matter of presentation, this is the title for my presentation My Greater Archives, Northern Muslim Sensibilities and the Crisis of Self Government. I want to just uh, give a brief explanation about why the title is changed. The paper is an all engaging discussion. Was divided because 
uh, from what I see in the migrated archives, there is a lot we need to understand about the British hierarchy regarding these documents and the way they enhance our understanding of divide and rule in the context of decolonization, 1953 to 1960. Well, the fact that divide and rule has been discussed so far by previous scholars, so I do not consider it as part of my own presentation. My own presentation is trying to bring out something new from the migrated archives so that I will show the extent to which the migrated archives enhance our understanding of this aspect of Nigerian history. So that's why I redu I mean, I narrow down my focus to the concern of most Northern Muslim sensibilities. Uh, 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 my paper is fitted into the theme, general theme of the conference on identity and the culture. Of course, I'm looking at it from the perspective of Northern identity in the context of 1953 to 1960, which is uh, in the framework of the migrated archives term as Northern Muslim sensibilities. This is the first time I have come across something like that. And when I checked the existing body of literature, which so far pointed out a lot about this period, I have not seen these points coming out very clear. So that's why I consider it part of my presentation. Of course, the Northern position, some of my colleagues in the previous session have already discussed about it is concerned with the issue of Northern position regarding the Enahoros motion of self-government in 1956. And this Northern position was all about the training of Northern public civil service personnel. And then the question uh, the population principle of 50% representation in the national legislature. Then the question of religion, which is quite sensitive but very important, in the discussion of the whole uh, Northern Nigerian historiography in this context. Because this is the ideological standpoint through which the Northern leaders perceived in court Southern domination, or let me say Christian domination, because the regions had already been divided along religious lines. So I'm concerned with this aspect, and I came across an incremental evidence to yeah. stop the previous evidences already provided by scholars in the existing body of literature. This is more like an externally oriented factor about these Northern Muslim sensibilities, which we have not known before, um, which is why I bring it here for you to guide me and to maybe help me with some information for libraries, archives, newspapers, where you think I can deeply research on this particular Mayimo aspect. This is the question of uh, Arab nationalism spearheaded by Egypt under Jamal Abdel Nasser. It has a connection with Northern Nigeria in this period because there was a Nigerian study group in existence which was promoting the same subversive tactics because the British colonial government referred to Jamal Abdel Nasser's role in Africa as an Arab subversive tactics trying to maybe torment the British extent to which it can control the northern and southern region because it was all about competition between the southern region, the northern region, and the British colonial government. Each of them had their own interest to protect. So I brought this point into question to understand what is about this Egyptian issue and how does it relate with northern Nigeria in this period? Because this issue come out at a very time when the Northern was threatening for succession from the Federation. And there was all this issue of religion that was so empathic in the existing files we have from the migrated archives. In fact, evidences are there, which I pointed out a lot of issues regarding the religious concern. And it was not me, it was from the evidence. It was not that the North was very sensitive in part in that time. So I have some few slides which I want to follow quickly. Uh, you see, I have started talking about the migrated archives in brief, and I brought the scholars, our attention to the scholars who were the authorities on this regard, and they explain about the migrated archives, what it means and what it does, what it is not. Um, so, uh, you see, you see, it was starting with tea leaves, we ban from all of them are trying to give us an understanding of the African archive. But what I come across is the issue of the righteous sex, the righteous secret, 
of the mandated archive. Some it is of development issues. Some see it as a rational act because of particular dynamics and scholars, especially black African scholars, to access this document. And that's why they refer to it as a rational act. Some of them see it as part of the uh, uh, British Act of sorting out some documents, removing them and destroying them, burning them as soon as possible. Like that is because this government were trying to embarrass the colonial authority, and that's why they were trying to remove it. Some of them were seeing it from this angle, but rather they were seeing it from the perspective of a British colonial hierarchy in terms of representing Her Majesty's views. These are really misrepresenting the views of Nigerian leaders at the time. So these are all about the digital archives. They have highlighted they have discussed how this is just in the not my own purpose. <laughs> then these are the selected files I have. Uh, on the migrated archives from which I started a lot of evidences and the facts talking about this issue of northern Muslims and celebrities. You see, uh, I explained the northern Muslims and celebrities all about the public sites as a training of the population issue of the team that the North was trying to maintain. Then the ideological standpoint so who do not see all these things. Because this gap from 1953 when the whole where this motion for self government to 1960. The Northern region was trying to uh, use this opportunity to uh, train their own public service because their complaint was that they did not have uh, uh, you know, public service personnel to handle uh, so, sorry, the, 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 the whole affairs of the Northern region at the time. So, in, in part, this is also tell us about the politics of the transfer of power. There is an impression regarding that because the British came with the aim of giving Nigeria independence within the time space of 30 years, not only two years. So it was trying to defend her interests, and the North was also trying to defend her interests. At the same time, the South was trying to push her interests. The North was trying to, uh, you know, maintain her position within the question of religion. Religion was there. And it was exploited by the British to promote divide and that's why I tied this question with divide uh, Not only within the South and the Northern region, but even within the framework of the political parties in the North, the NATO and the NPC, there was a theological debate of religion. And then the same thing between the minority uh, ethnic groups, that is the middle belt in the Northern region, and the majority Muslims in the North, there was all this kind of division. There was a lot of discussion about it. Then I move forward to uh, uh, no cite some evidence from the migrated archives. But there you can see. You see, a correspondent dated to 1st July 1952 has that we have got to keep a very careful eye on attempt at penetration. But, uh, no, no, this is not the, the slides. You see, Northern Muslim sensibility and the question of religion. This is the court. Uh, Islamic concerns must be handled carefully. If Northern leaders felt concerned for the future of Islam, it will drive the North out of Nigeria. That anything that may raise the religious spirit of the Muslim North should be discouraged so that the North will remain united with the South. You see how the British was trying to frame religion along this kind of division, uh, perceiving North as Muslims, essentially. And then perceiving South as Christian, yes. 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 despite the fact that there are even among the house of who were house of and who were the dominated Muslims in the North, there were Christians. Mm -hmm. The same in the South, you find the Igbo, there were Muslims, the Yoruba were Muslims, some of them were Muslims. Mm -hmm. but various ethnic groups, you see, there is religious diversity within the two religions. Then I also find the question of Islam as a potential threat, but it can be very, very clear that the migrated archives were revealing this one. That Islam was a potential to this issue came out from an intelligence report between French colonial government and the British colonial government at the time, trying to show that yes, the, what is the going on in Egypt at the time is likely going to consume the whole part of northern Nigeria, which is, was part of the remaining uh, part of the British colonial entity at the time. So they were very, very worried about it, and they have cited some uh, 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 quotation where it is said that uh, we have got to keep a, a very careful eye on attempt at penetration by the Egyptian 
and other desirable Muslims in northern Nigeria, and indeed in Nigeria as a whole. And this was trying to show that, yes, the British had another worry you know, of allowing the North to go on its own. And that's why they were trying to promote the propaganda that they were trying to unite the country, whereas it was not, because the British were trying to protect our interests. But they used this, you understand, to prevent the North from succeeding, because if they lose the Northern region, likely they lose a very large part of the colonial entity of the tank. And so that's why they delayed the colonization from 1953 up to 1960. Is it time? Okay. Yeah. So you see, in the next slide also, there is another evidence from the migrated archives regarding the Arabs of Bashi, because I try to point out how it works out. You see, there is a letter marked off second, because most of these documents were marked second, the red covers. Uh -huh. So they were accusing German of the Nazi of accordingly fostered a widespread campaign of subversion in the many British and the French colonial territories and in all the defendant Arab states lied to the, to the West. Nationalists and progressive political parties and groups now started giving off to, to Cairo for their inspiration, a steady flow of Egyptian teachers and Islamic missions out from Cairo. Uh, money to the Algerian nationalists and other fighters against Western imperialism, and a constant blast of virulent and Western propaganda in France and above all the Cairo radio, because even the Nigerian study group in Cairo were using the Cairo radio to promote this subversive act. That was the allegation. And there was one Faik, uh, Faisal or something from Lagos who was based in Cairo, was trying to train Northern, Northern students there to promote this kind of subversive act in the Northern region when the North was trying to, to succeed from the Federation. There was this evidence very clear. Though political party was not established based in Cairo that caused allegiance from any political parties in the Northern region at the time. But there is this worry. This worry was very remarkable in the United States. Uh, and then in another letter, which is, was also marked secret, I tried to point out why, you see, the worry was not on the northern region, because French might be worried, yes, because French adopted policy of assimilation, frustration, but in trying to, the northern region, uh, the British colonial government, through indirect rule, and the aristocracy is established emirs and district officers and so on and so forth tried to understood Islam and they allowed Islam to operate so that they convince the local people about what the colonial entity is all about. So they do not have problem with the North because they already, they already established cordial relationship with the North. It is quite there in the literature if you look at Yahoo BM and so on and so forth. But their worry is how should the North is going to owe allegiance to, I mean, the Islamic sympathy from Arabs and use it as a mechanism or as a religious tool to promote, you know, Arab nationalism. So the worry is there. The Federation, this is quoted from one, uh, one uh, British colonial person, the Federation is at present divided into a predominantly Muslim North and a predominantly non-Muslim South. So far, as one could join, the North was not at all sympathetic to, sympathetic to Egypt mm -hmm. and the Arab imperialists ends of, I'm um, sorry, uh, Colonel Nasser. But the North naturally and properly had a deep sympathy with Islam. You understand? That is my emphasis. So they were very worried about that. So what I'm saying, let me just conclude, trying to do in essence is that this issue was not very much discussed in the existing body of literature. In the context of 1950 to 1953, I want you to guide me, point out some newspapers, or other migrated, uh, sorry, archives where I could find more document on this particular aspect so that I should deepen my research on it. You know, the migrated archives tell us about more about uh, uh, these issues we didn't know, which is quite very significant. But then they didn't tell us about how all this saga of religious, religious issues, Muslims, and services fitted into the discussion of the Bible. <laughs> I'll come at the last bit, which is a lot of the British background of tradition control. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my colleagues have been saying so much about uh, the Migrated Archives since our first session in the morning. And um, glad is my heart that to a large extent, we have an overview of what um, the archives are all about. But one of the very important aspects of um, subject line um, under the colonial regime was how they were policed. And yeah, no, yeah, it's under, yeah. So one of the one of the very most important part of subject life in the colonial um, era was how they were policed, and then um, I'm going to take us through you know this journey of how the British government um, created a structure around the policing of uh, of, of colonial Nigeria towards Nigeria's independence. Now, in in my second slide here. I have an excerpt from one of the files in the migrated archives that was supplied to us. Second slide, please. Second slide. So it reads us, it says, we are still digging out information about precedents in other federation, including the United States of America and India, but I do not believe they are going to help us at all. In fact, I feel that so far as the important, as, as the important questions of operational control is concerned, they may positively tell against us should I be right on this, it will be all over more important to ensure that the arrangement we, were make, we are making in Nigeria form a good precedent for others. Now, what, what this tells us is that the colonial governments of Nigeria were trying all their best possible to draw inferences from other countries as to what political structure, what policing structure rather, should be inherited or should be carried on into independent Nigeria. And then these inferences were drawn from, say, America and India. But they thought that if these influences would pay off, if these influences rather would, would, be, would be operational in Nigeria, it would not pay the British colonial uh, in the government. And that raises the question, why does the British colonial government intend to have a policing structure that ties to its own dictates? It's a very important question. Then we'll continue. So the methodology I'll be using in this work, um, I'll be adopting an historical analysis uh, document review um, from the archival documents from the declassified files of the National Archives London. And now, from a past of structural colonial subversions at every point of Nigeria's national life, you know, at the, at the, at the eve of independence, where Nigeria was, 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 was preparing for independence, the colonial government was preparing it to grow and coexist as a nation. British colonial government's intention, either it was genuine or not, would not be the core of our discussion at this point. But then this intention was to ensure that one of the most important administrative structures with which the colony governed, which the, the colony was governed, was to be strengthened to ensure that these very religions that were merged at the altar of convenience would not be overridden by you know, the emerging religions, even, even at independence. As such, the regulation and control and structural establishment of this structure was to emerge. And that brought about the discussion on controlling the affairs of the police force towards Nigeria's independence. Then the questions arise. Why did the British colonial government move to control the, the, the police force in Nigeria? What importance is the regulation, especially within the context of the period of study 1953 to 1959? And then what implication does this establishment of the establishment of these control measures hold for independent Nigeria? Next slide. I, I reviewed literatures from the works of Tekene Tamuno on the policing in modern Nigeria, 1861 to 1965, that, that gave us a, a, a background to what Niger uh, policing was uh, within the period he um, Tamolo uh, interrogated, 1861 to, to 1965. I also interrogated a lot of works that um, Ken Rutimi did on policing, uh, where he, she, he looked at um, community reaction to policing, um, the emergence of pseudo militia or pseudo uh, uh, unofficial policing in Nigeria. I also um, interrogated the work of Alemica, um, where he examined the complex relationship between rights-based policing, criminal justice, and human rights. And then there's a, there's a very distinct dimension that Saeed Adirinto took it, where he interrogated gun in, 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 in Nigeria. Uh, the, the, the emergence of gun in, 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 in Nigeria changed the, 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 the social fabric of Nigeria entirely. And it launched Nigeria into a society, uh, what, what, what he called um, a gun society. But then, not to waste our time, we'll move on. 
Now, the control of the Nigerian police force in the 1950s underwent series of transformation. Colonial police in Nigeria had received you know, scholarly attention like the ones I just mentioned. Now, this research will study the colonial administration necessity of creating a sustainable police force, one that will extend beyond the impending Nigerian independence, and then the British government's challenges. There, there were a lot of challenges that they faced in establishing this control. And then, first, the, the, the establishment of a force that could adequately address the bureaucratic you know, issues of a police personnel was of great concern. And then, second, during the, the colonization era of the 1950s, a great concern of the British administration for the MPF was stemming from the fear of politicization. And this politicization was not just an ordinary fear. The fear was the British colonial government feared Nigeria would succeed in the future. And then it, this is very, very important because just seven years after, there was a let loose. There was, there, there was a problem. There was a bang in the country. So which means that these colonial structures that were put in place towards independence could not even, could not even survive you know, the newborn you know, nation. So you know, the policy structure was that important for the colonial government uh, because they felt if this structure is not properly put in place, if this structure is not properly nurtured, if, it's not, if, it's not, if it is not well nursed, it could lead to one region taking over the other region, one region using uh, the advantage, uh, a, a particular advantage over the other. And then we'll move on to the next one. Next slide, please. I want to conceptualize the time po police and policing. For several, I mean, for several readers or for several people, it may look differently. And for several societies, it could be termed differently also. Now, but in this, in this context, I, I employed what my name defined as police and policing. The terms police and policing are two different, but yes, they, they are analogous concepts, but they are marked by a distinct feature, their fluidity, their relationship, how they work together in Andy. Police is an institution, organization, and policing system vary both in idea and in practice from one political community to the other. Next slide. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding all of this, there are some common recognized abstract ideas surrounding the concept of police and policing that needs to be addressed here. Beginning with the term police, it is technically used to describe or refer to an organization of specially trained personnel entrusted with the responsibility of securing the lives and properties of individuals and groups within a given polity or society or community. Now, we would not see, as I explained further, if truly the policing structure that Nigeria inherited of independence fits into this definition of what police should be or a concept of, of police. Moreover, as central actors in the criminal justice system, they are conventionally expected to investigate, prevent criminal activities, assist in prosecuting suspected criminals, and help the victims get access to justice. In so doing, the police further expected to be fair, truthful, and community oriented. Next slide. On the other hand, policing is an organized activity that is set up by either the state or non state actors, which is aimed at ensuring the institutionalization and maintenance of common order, security, and peace through elements of prevention, deterrence, investigation of breaches and punishment. Now, I am going to um, get a little. This, conce this conceptualization now tells us that. Either we like it or not, the concept of policing has been part and parcel of Africa in, and, 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 and in this context, Nigerian uh, community over time, even before the, 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 our, our, our contact with uh, Europe. This is, it is an organized activity set up by either the state or not state actors, which is aimed at ensuring the maintenance of common order to a very large extent. Uh, uh, African or Nigerian communities, pre the advent of uh, the European uh, government, maintained a degree of peace and order. But so not to waste our time, let me let me get into into the proper you know uh, discussion. Now this picture tells us two different eras. We have an era of police that Yoruba calls Olokpa by the left. Now this Olokpa would mean that. The police, the police at that period were not allowed to carry hands. They were just there to, to maintain law and order, although to a very large extent, they were used by the colonial government to foment a whole lot of oppression. Mm -hmm. But to a large extent, they were still a little bit of um, uh, sensitivity to their, to, 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 their, to, their, to their disposition. Now then, we look at the other picture, we, we see three policemen harassing a young man. Now, how did we move from here to here? This tells us a gap. This gives us a gap. This gives us, uh, you know, a, 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 an ideological, you know, uh, picture representation of what has changed between what used to be and what we have now. Next slide. 
The British government of Nigeria had established a public service commission prior to 1953, and as I thought the provision and legal parameters with which the public service commission was established was not enough to cater for the demands and nature of the policing, stru of the policing structure. Now, this is it. The, poli the, the, the British government, in their bid to create uh, a policing structure that would not yield to the successive idea that could emanate as Nigeria's independence felt, the best thing to do is to create an independent structure for the policing, uh, uh, for the police. And to create this independent structure, they have to detach the, poli the, the, the police from the public service. They have to detach the, the, the police from the public service. And so, um, Little Thing in 1953 proposed the idea that a, pub a police service commission should be created. And these were for several reasons. First, they thought so, so far the civil services were concerned. The safeguard against political interference, which has been established by setting up of the public service commission, may not prove indefinitely reliable. Second, the British government thought in the case of the civil service, expecting a devoid of political interference was a matter of expediency and not of principle. It is, it is very hard, even in our contemporary history, in our contemporary administrative structure, to, to separate the public service commission from politicization. And so literally thought that the best way to create that independence for the, for, for the police is to draw out the policing structure away from the public service. Third, it was thought that the inclusion of the police into the civil service would weaken the policing system of the Nigerian state. And if by the virtue of this reality, the policing system is not created under proper regulatory and independent body, it will be left no choice but to be administered by the governor, whose authority can overshadow the principles and capacity of the, of the, of the police. Next slide. Now, at the 1953 London Conference, there were a lot of deliberation on the floor in the House. Now, one of the perceived, one of the perceived um, apprehension that the British government had was that the Western region particularly had very intimidating tendencies to use police against other regions. For instance, Aulawa um, called for, Aulawa called for, you know, a population, more population of the local government uh, police, uh, 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 police authority and the native authority uh, police force. We wanted more people, we wanted more, more people to join this police force. Now, the fear of the colonial government was that if the, 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 the Western region has more policing structure within, it could, lead to, it could lead to them asking them to merge together to form a regional force. That is one. Secondly, if Aula was succeed to do this, he might ask for them to be armed. And if they are armed, this would lead to a, a, an intention to use this armed police force against other regions. And at that point, do not forget, the Western region had grown so much actors that were very, very intellectual, versatile activists who were part of the decolonization uh, you know, uh, process. And so it was just normal, it was just normal and natural for the colonial government to think the Western region would use this imagined you know, front against the unity or the coexistence of a united Nigeria. Um, I'm running out of time already, so I'll be, I will be you know, rounding up in bits. Now, one of the things I am I'm still looking at, I'm still looking to, to address in this work, because of course it's an ongoing um, you know, research. One of the things I'm still looking at to look at is um, the question of ultravirus. Ultravirus is a legal um, uh, provision that, that limited the creation of regional government or regional uh, you know, policy, or policy structure in colonial government, in, in the colonial era rather. Then also, I'm looking at uh, policing towards independence and police involvement during the 1959 general election and the 1960, 1961 uh, legislative election. I beg my pardon, uh, it should be 1961, not 1962. Then, of course, the British government aim of a tactical movement of forces to suppress disturbances. Now, while I round up, all of these that I have discussed are, without, are not without implications for contemporary Nigeria. We have just seen some, some about four years ago the case of the NSAS. I mean, Comment, uh, social comment, commentators and you know, citizens have decried the fact that if the policing structure of Nigeria was to be left in the hands of perhaps uh, maybe state policing or, or what have you, perhaps who, who shot the gun, who ordered the, 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 the gunshot and lucky would have been given more answers. And also, we also saw the militarization of the police of, of, of the, of, of the uh, policing structure. Today in Nigeria, police 
police harass, police militarize against average Nigerians. And this is as a result of you know, the administrative uh, policy that has been put in place right from the, uh, the, the, the eve of independence. And lastly, impact on governance and on security. We would see that in, 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 in current Nigeria, we are even at risk of, of the police. States, regions are now coming together to create a pseudo uh, security outfit to cater for the security of lives and properties of their citizens, which should not be. On this note, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Um, and we are not going to be able to I think we, okay. we have three fantastic papers, so much to discuss. Um, but then, before I call on our audience uh, to interrogate the presenters' uh, papers, I want to take the first shot. And uh, my Comment is going to be comment to uh, Ms. Bao Peter. Um, firstly, I think uh, you probably you are asking for literatures and sources. Um, I think you should also look at what Ajayi and Ikuku have done on transfer of power. I think they have a chapter in a book, Decolonization in Africa. Edited by this Busa and Gifford or something. So I can get you the, the uh, uh, reference. Then, secondly, um, I don't know if it's available in Kaduna, but I know there is a file at the National Archives in Ibadan if it has not been misinterpreted. There's a file there on the activities of Muslims in Nigeria. Now, there's another file in London on the intelligence report on activities of Sheikh Ibrahim Niaz when it was being monitored by the French and the British around 19, from 1945, 1950, up to independence. Yeah. I mean, intelligence reports following him from Kaula to Kano, looking at the activities of, because when you mentioned Muslims in the North, and I have a question of, Question mark. Muslims in the north. Are you talking about Sunni or Tariqa? Because British government had different policy for the two, you know, uh, sects. When they were when they were dealing with Sunni movement, they have a different, you know, ideological disposition towards them. If they are dealing with Tariqa, they are dealing with transnational organization with potential for violence. I mean, they specifically mentioned the Sanusia the Tijaniya, the Wahhabiya, the Mahdi, they have a different intelligence report on these people because they are potential to cross, to cause regional instability. It's a, a, a big, it was a big problem for the British. So you probably look at how did they manage these you know, different sets across West Africa? Because it was not just Nigeria problem. It is a movement right from Senegal, Mali, up to Morocco. Then, there after the problem of Egypt, Nassau, and what I do, I mean, it all ties together to the extent that they had a, a kind of a regional conference. So it was a secret conference between the British and the French. And they were able to, you know, they came together in spite of their own rivalry in controlling, you know, post-colonial West African Economy. Um, let uh, Kunle Nawal add the paper, the British commercial interest during the colonization process. You might also want to look at that paper. And um, secondly, my comment also for uh, Musba on the, this policy. Um, what is okay. uh, okay. sorry. Yes, then uh, I think policing and state control, the British policing system and state control. You see. The British wants to sustain their, you know, uh, control over the citizen. So state police is an instrument of what Foucault would call government governmentality to control the people because you need to control the people before you extract their resources. So are there files on letters, files on complaint to the colonial secretary on police excessiveness? 
uh, there are cases of unrest as a result of police uh, citizen reaction to police brutality, just like what we had uh, during the NSAS, so that you can create nexus between this colonial reality and the uh, post-colonial reality. Now, um, lastly, to Sarah, I think it's a very wonderful work um, looking at changing women identity and social status in a uh, uh, kingdom. Um, we look forward to your study because it's not an easy thing to change tradition in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So we are looking forward to that study. So I would like to call on everybody, just um, if you want to question, comments, observation, so the floor is so We have comments, questions, observations. Okay. Yes, I okay. I must appreciate the efforts of the presenters in their wonderful papers. But even if somebody or nobody talks, I have to talk about women. <laughs> because I am a woman. And when you consider the issue of um, women being victims of um, tradition and patriarchy, it is the discourse that has been ongoing for long. I want to ask whether the woman is a widow or not. Generally, women are presented to be victimized. But I want to ask, who victimizes women? Who victimizes women? Is it the tradition? Is it the projected common enemy to women? That is the man. Because if you don't get to the roots of this problem, if you want to attack tradition, who is tradition? And when you are saying this should be done to liberate them, this should be done, who should do that to liberate the woman? Whether the woman is a widow or not. So my question is, who actually victimizes women? If this tradition, I have not seen, you know, a widow. They will say the younger brother or the well, relative from the late husband should marry the woman. Who implements that tradition? If they say that a woman's hair should be scraped after the, the death of the husband, I've not seen a man that cuts a woman's hair because the husband dies. And if they say that the woman should be chased out of the house, everything collected from her, who does that? So I think one issue should help us to define who is, who are we looking at as this person that is victimizing this? So that we know where we channel our efforts. So are we not channeling our efforts wrongly? So let us get the problem okay. stated and then know who should be the one to liberate? Is it government? Is it Tinubu? Is it Nigerian government that should come and liberate the woman? Please, let us look at it so that they put it in more active perspective. Thank you. Okay, um, I want to commend the presenters uh, for their insights uh, in pictures. Um, talking on the issue of uh, where the government, uh, one would, okay. One would want to know, um, in fact, I'm particularly interested in um, changes that have occurred over time uh, and different family structures, uh, what, uh, what impact education had or has had. Um, uh, widows, educated, professional women who lost their husbands, are they subjected to the same a widowhood practices as those who are in the village uh, and are not 
as educated and literate as their counterparts in the cities. Um, and of course, uh, I, I agree with the, uh, the question who, who uh, the importance of identifying who victimizes or subjected women to these um, dehumanizing practices. Uh, because of course, um, uh, in a family, uh, some of us, uh, we are a good number of us are Nigerians, and we come from various families. And uh, I remember when my uh, my brother um, passed, uh, we were given the opportunity to determine what will happen to the wife. And the consensus is that she has her life to live. Nobody touches her hair. Nobody subjected her to sitting on the floor for weeks. Or, in fact, as soon as the, the funeral ceremonies were over and everybody left the village, she left too. So it is important to identify these uh, uh, actors and, and layers when we talk about uh, widowhood uh, practices and widows. Um, then the... We are talking of uh, a fair land, which is in River State, if I understood the presentation. Um, I'm wondering whether there have been um, either through women's movement or uh, the state policies, whether there have been changes in terms of laws to protect women and orphans. Um, then the issue of uh, uh, colonial policing, uh, quite an interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm just um, uh, looking at the, the two images you showed. Um, I, want, I, I wonder what you recommend that would help make the Nigerian police more effective. Do you recommend regional policing or state policing or the federalized system we have where, I mean, uh, the centralized system we have where the, 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 the federal government controls uh, uh, the police? Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. So, Nip, please. And we have to, I told you, let me start with the issue of the I, I, I saw a wide gap between the two pictures you showed to us. Though we can agree that with the vote of the modality, yeah, but the former ones are more or less like palace guards who are majorly those ones. That's why they call them Kolopa. Who have been normally used by the uh, the king or the chiefs of this. But it's entirely come to another dimension where the British colonial has to adopt them and use them. So I think I want us to try that particular balance. Now, that one aside, I want to go to some of the things you narrated, which I believe some of them, it is we rely on the British uh, other writings and what they told us. But the, the, the one that makes a, a clearer segregation among the Wahhabism, the Amadi, the Tijania, and the and then at the end of the day, they are still the same people that wrote a report about okay, some are militant, some are that degenerated a kind of palava during that particular time. It was more or less like the way we have a uh, different segment about religion. All of them cannot be called the same name. They have different way and different. Way. But the issue of trying to make them look like they are violent or the other, it was a report which was written by them. For them, not particularly within the sub region. The report, they will tell you at the end of the intelligence report. That's why they call some people violent or some people are extremists. Or that. So it was a report written by them in order to create some kind of confusion, even between you and those particular sects, so that it will be easier for them. It's, a, it's just a system of divide and rule. That's what I believe in that particular one. So, and then we need to put that particular perspective in everything because most of the text we read actually come from that particular side. Not that, okay, we have the one that was written and somebody clearly has a, 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 an intelligent report based on their activities, no. I don't know whether that clarification is being so, I want to. Well, uh, okay, you go up. 
I can think it is going to be quite interesting to have a conversation on subsidies and biting Nigerian history. But it is okay for us to rely on the intelligence reports, um, archival documents. But at the same time, why should I bring a change on the qualities of information management or archival? But going to that particular paper, um, it is not just only intelligence report, right from the Osmodan Folio 1804 to that there have always been sex and ideological contestation in the North among Muslims. It is not just the British creation, it's there. Though it can be swear by the British for their own selfish interest, mm -hmm. but the, the desire to control, to control space, to control religious space has always been there. And this, I mean, a lot of scholars who have first time information with first Mr. Adama, first Mr. Adama, like Mori, have documented this tension. And the tension is still there. Up to now, you see it in the world. It is very possible to see the world of this is Izala representing Sunni, Tijaniya yeah. Mosque. Yeah. So you see that symbolism. It's, it is not just in the British creation. But what I'm saying is, of course, the Biden rule is the Lunar Tap changes to perpetrate their own agreement. But it's going to be a nice conversation to talk about the dialogue. Do we rely on archival documents to write African history? If not, then what do we rely on foreign tradition 100%? Then we can take that from there. Oh, that's how we do. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just want to keep it on video. I published a paper while I was still in the system on video practices, where I had one on one interview with the leaders, the women in the village. The shocker I had was that. When I interviewed the, what we call him, the daughters, the daughters of the compound or the village, very strong group in every village. Strong group. And uh, they pursue a source of government in villages. There are things you have to do if the Umwada says no. So, when, when I interviewed the men, they asked me, why don't you go to the woman and I said, if a woman does not want to shave her hair, who enforces it? It is the woman that will say, who is she? That was my brother died, and she's not going to shave my brother in due respect. She must shave her hair. It must be shaved, and so on. The men are, I think the, the men are just push it to the women, to the woman, that, and they're behind them. So I, I tell the men, if you come in and say, stop this, they will stop it. The woman that will stop. Mm -hmm. But because you are enjoying it, that's why the woman that can do anything about widowhood, you allow the woman that to take power right. from you. So, and it is, it is not everywhere that women are, we are our worst enemies. Mm -hmm. Women, even in politics, a woman might be good, they'll say, ah, she's going out at night, she will leave her family. What is she doing at night? What <laughs> men don't know what they do there. No, nobody knows what they do there. <laughs> it is politics. <laughs> like men, when you are not there, when they are deciding who is going to represent your community, then they will text whoever is there. They will say, don't leave uh, Mrs. Sue, who is in the house. Go and wake her up and give her this position. So I am just saying that we, women, women are okay. responsible yes. for most of the problems the widows go through, and I experienced it personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I want to thank the first one. I said when when I. Share the experience of my uh, my sister in law. The the power was given to us, including me as a member of Umwana, and we decided that nothing will happen to her. Nobody should touch her hair. Uh, it wasn't as an individual. It was because I'm a member of Umwana in my 
family. Sorry, you, you don't uh, base your exposure to modern yeah. uh, yes. Western education. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for three great papers uh, and a really interesting discussion in the room afterwards. I guess um, my question is to all three speakers. I'll be interested to know how you plan to develop these projects further from now. And also, if there are additional sources that you haven't used yet, that you think it would be useful to consult when um, developing this research further. Thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? Okay, I think we can have the uh, uh, so just the key points I presented. So I appreciate all these comments and contributions. However, when you read my the main work, which I also have in a flash drive, and I think that after attending these LSA studies, I need to impute a lot more. You know, from what I have seen, what I have heard here, a lot needs to be done again on that work. I'll do that. Now, let me start with, first of all, if there are any changes so far. Yes, in 2022, um, His Excellency, um, Barisane Sumike, did sign a bill into law. Um, are making girls and women to inherit from their father's houses. The reason is that land is claimed to be communal in a prayer and query. In that same river state, the judge, that's the, um, we call them the judge, Calabari, Oprika, Boni, all those, they don't practice it. Because they are matrimonial. They eat from their mother's pots. That's how we treat it. So you see, even to their grandchildren, inherit in their houses, whether you are a girl or not. Um, and in my main work, I did uh, recommend that the educated people, educated women, should not leave us alone. Prof, you were given you were given that opportunity to go and decide for your brother's wife because your family is rich. And educated. The men are already <laughs> they are already afraid. Obina is Obina 2019. He's a man. He's a prof in uniforms. He wrote also that is that the women could actually uh, stop this, but because they want to they want to please their husband when they leave that place. That's why they carry out these things. Joy Agumago also said that Ugu. 2002 also said that they're all in my book there. I will appreciate our research more and put more into that. So when you have educated women, you know, you, they don't suffer this much. At most, most educated people don't even invest in the rural areas. They invest in the cities because already they know, they have the knowledge that if they die, if they live tomorrow, that their children, they will not want their children to go through all that. The most they will do, the community will do, is say, bring us a car for your mom. And your children will afford that and just give them that car and go ahead. And then, uh, whether the widows in the rural areas are professional, oh, professional women, of course, they are tied into the educated ones and all that. Yes, um, those ones can afford to live, even if it is just on bungalow that the men have built. Now, this work is even this part two of a bigger work. That is the uh, women's right to own property in FAA lands. This habit has actually led to the um, slow, slow organization of areas in FAA land because the rich ones, the educated ones, they do not invest in their villages. They don't go to the cities, migrate to the cities and so on. They are their children and they invest there. If they come home on Christmas Day, by 26 after the Umayyad meeting, they go, so they don't come, and that also is making the slow uh, developments in those areas. But we desire better developments because if these interventions mentioned in this work are actually carried out, 
for those that remain in the village to be better. But also, I am thinking that, as which I mentioned in the book, that if you leave us alone, if you leave the widows alone, the educated ones, then you will see the carrying the burden of having to share the little you have or the much you have with these people. Most of you who are in the cities know that you have to send money up keep for those in the village. Is that not a uh, drain in your pocket? So from nothing that dream, you should help us in this advocacy. So this is a stronger, this is even a stronger panel than the over 2000 of them. It's a stronger one. So who does the victimization? Is the men. They do it on that. The women are just the they, the men are the ones that see the gods and come and tell us that the gods will do this. So women I interviewed during this research told me that if they went to the land, I told them, couldn't you at least stand by the riverside? Those are you know, lands that they don't really um, do anything with. The women don't even go there. They said the devil, the devils will kill them. I said, Abba woman, that is, they will kill me. Who told them that? They don't go to the shrine. It's the men that go. Uh, so, but when it has to do with a man, who loses his wife? The very next thing, before the woman is in there, he has married enough. So you can imagine. So it's the men that are actually perpetuating this. They just use the women. So if we are to say, so who exactly are we supposed to be talking to? We are talking to all of them. We are begging the men. We are begging them because we don't have the much strength yet. But if we gather enough um, uh, support, we will not be begging them. We will be now stressing on the implementation. And they were also talking to the women that they should make their lives better. You come to my area, 12-year-old children, and uh, immediately they finish primary school. They are thinking of doing something to be able to support their mothers. They go into this. Uh, the new one is this one that they go abroad in the name of getting jobs. And they go there, slaughter them and everything. The Ministry of Women Affairs is really trying, trying to you know, sensitize people. And we are joining boys with them. And uh, you see them into all forms of slavery, into prostitution. The recent one is having to surrogate for people. Very, very funny thing. They sell the children as low as 50,000. Then those ones who come to buy from the village, I'm telling you the truth, you can investigate it yourself because they're trying to look for means of sustenance. Mm -hmm. But how much longer will this industry thrive? But if we intervene, if we intervene by giving them something really sustainable, like industries and so on, we see that it will be well in those reforms. Thank you for the honesty. I hope um, a good more advocacy will change in reality. It will. Yeah, uh, we not. I, I, think, I just want to make an issue on like just I'm very much shaken by the work of the area and the focus of the intellectual situation. But then the question of Islamic democracy is what I come about. I think this research has a limited question in number. It is very coarse. But then when you when you see when you talk about uh, the Sufi denominations because the Bala was not there. He, I know the worries have started to know when Nigeria when he is like the Sufi that's why the denomination had to be assimilated. And if we are talking about religious denominations, like when we are going to back the Abbasid Caliphs and originated from the conversations over the, the, the succession of the Prophet, like, you know, started from them. My research. Is not based on the discussion of the nominations in the context of religious survivalism in the North and the Arab part of My research focuses on how this Arab revolt, Arab nationalism, Arab movement influenced the British world to the extent of the main decolonization process in the East. So I'm claiming it in the context of decolonization, not in the context of religious conflict. I try to point what you said. That's why the fact that yes, to some extent, I will have to discuss the extent to which the ideological standpoint in the various denominations are in this context. But that is the focus. The focus is how I think the panel of five minutes in that. 
Okay, um, I want to talk to the workhouse position. If um, question like that, if there are powers of police brutality reported to the federal government, well, there are part, there are instances of the citizens reporting to the federal government, but I did not find any of that in the Mandela Archives document. But I have encountered some at files at the National Archives now. So, and then that would um, dovetail into what uh, Dr. Tin asked about um additional sources so that would now that would that would be a project in my part on how i can measure or compare you know sources and then you know some part of um, the market archives that i can't find that i can find rather in national archives repository i can then merge together then um prof asked if um, I, I would make recommendation as to um how to make the policing more effective well i would say that at this at this time point Taking taking side as far regional state or centralized you know policing structure would be a little bit problematic because there are a lot of structures that we now have in contemporary Nigeria that would not make whichever one we choose to do very very successful. Take for instance um, our 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 bureaucratic structure. You know if we if we go for state state policing, the tendency that the governor would, would control the police or use the police against uh, you know or opponents is very high. The same thing that then if you go for regional, who controls when there is no leadership, you know, it all can it can do things into, do into violence or you know, um not then explanation of the balance between the old police and the palace guy. From the picture I I put up there, those um policemen were not palace guards, they were policemen, they were policemen of the native authority police, early police. Yeah, those uh, uh, the 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 constabulary, the constabulary from the outside region started first, and they will now have the earlier local government police force. The, the palace guard would not dress in that uniform. That is a uniform. So I think that would be all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for the uh, please permit me and then um, for I mean bring to our attention to the area of the uh, some of us are very present uh, 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 Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>